Good afternoon and uh, welcome to Grand Rounds today. Please remember to sign the attendance record at the back of the auditorium and please remember to fill out the program evaluations and if you could give us any ideas in regards to future topics or future speakers, we would be appreciative. Also, uh, please remember to turn back in the audience response cards. Uh, today, I have the uh, pleasure of introducing Dr. El Ziad El Zogby. Dr. El Zogby is board certified in uh, both internal medicine and nephrology. He is assistant professor of medicine at the Mayo uh, College of Medicine, and he is also a consultant in the Department of Hypertension and Nephrology. Uh, he has been extensively published, and he's on the uh, uh, review boards and editorial boards for several journals, and uh, also has been the director of the update in nephrology and a pancreas and uh, kidney transplantation at the Mayo Clinic, and he kindly has accepted our offer to drive down today to provide us with some nephrology pearls, and uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. El Zabi. Everyone can hear me? Thank you, Dr. Holberg, and I would like to thank the organizer for their invitation. I'm very delighted to be here. Uh, we had a very nice drive from Rochester down 35. Uh, I never made it beyond Albert Lee. That's called, we have a diocese unit there, which uh, I go tw twice a month to, to go there. So it was nice to see what's beyond that on 35. Uh, so, so I was asked uh, to uh, present some nephrology pearls. And uh, uh, these are my, my disclosure. Uh, and uh, the, the objective of the talk, uh, I will be presenting three, three cases covering these uh, objective. Uh, the first case will be uh, probably the, uh, the longest case, uh, and then we have two other shorter cases, and uh, uh, I welcome inter interaction and questions as well. I know there are some people uh, watching uh, offline here, uh, and uh, there will be some uh, some some questions that you, you you can you can vote on some of the question as well, uh, uh, and we should uh, I should be able to conclude my part in the next uh, four, 35 to forty minutes and then leave some time for questions. So we're, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, renal artery stenosis, uh, which has kind of become a, a, a hot, hot topic more recently. Uh, and uh, some metabolic complication related to the treatment of calciphylaxis, and then I'll talk about uh, some issue in uh, dialysis uh, population, uh, particularly the elderly. So I'm going to start with the first case, and uh, this is a 76-year-old uh, woman who has a, a history of smoking for about 30 years, uh, has hypertension, dyslipidemia, coronary artery disease, peripheral vascular disease, and history of amaurosis fugax. Uh, and she has history also of bilateral carotid endarterectomy in 2003 and a redo uh, a year later. And uh, she's clearly a vasculopath and she also has bilateral renal artery stenosis. And she's been uh, on the following medication that I listed here, which include a beta blocker, a nitrate, a statin, a baby aspirin, and uh, uh, clopidogrel uh, or Plavix as well. And her blood pressure has been difficult to control. Her systolic uh, has been in the 170 millimeter of mercury range. So in, in May of last year, she was hospitalized with hypertension er, uh, emergency with blood pressure of 280 over 100 uh, recorded. And she presented with shortness of breath and have evidence of uh, pulmonary edema as well. Um, so she, wa she was uh, treated uh, with uh, uh, drips initially to control her blood pressure, and once she was stabilized, in addition to her blood pressure treatment uh, uh, that she was on, I added Lasix uh, to her regimen as well as a calcium channel blocker. And she came for a clinic visit uh, at follow-up uh, a week or two later, and her blood pressure average was 154 over 89. She had a systolic ejection murmur on the exam, uh, some mild fitting edema. And prior to her appointment, she had a pre-scheduled six-hour blood pressure monitor, which uh, is shown here. And just to orient you a little bit, uh, so we have, this is a, the, the, the time, and this is a, a blood pressure readings. Each bar uh, is one, one reading, so you have the systolic, and then the, the diastolic, and then the dots here are the heart rate. 
And our uh, reference range for the systolic is kind of drawn here is 135, and then for the systolic, and then 85 for the diastolic. So clearly you can see here that her number are clearly uh, outside the uh, desired range. Uh, and the average was 154 over 89. You can see the variation of blood pressure uh, between 114 to 190 for the systolic, 70 to 110 for the diastolic. And about half the reading were above 155 uh, systolic. So this uh, brings me to the first question here. So which of the following regarding the use of an ACE inhibitor or ARB in renovascular disease uh, would be correct? One, they are contraindicated in bilateral renal artery stenosis. Two, they are associated with lower mortality. Three, they are associated with lower rates of AKI. Or four, they should be avoided in unilateral renal artery stenosis. I'll give you some time, you can go ahead and, and vote. So, okay, I guess a vote didn't show up, but let's see. Uh, oh, okay, so, so most, uh, most of you uh, said they are contraindicated in bilateral renal artery stenosis, and there's some sli slit respond. The, the correct answer is, is two. They are associated with lower mortality. And I'll show you some, some data uh, regarding that. So this is a, the paper from the, from the UK, uh, and, or the, some of the authors of the, the, from the UK and their collaboration with uh, people from the University of uh, Minnesota as well. So they had the advantage of having a kind of a registry data, and they included 621 patients. Uh, mean age of these patients were 71. Uh, and this patient has been followed on average for about three years. And in that group, so they, uh, some patients were on uh, angiotensin blocker or angiotensin receptor blocker, ACE inhibitor or ARB. And among the 378 patients who were on that, uh, 357 tolerated the medication well without any problem, so about 92, 92%. Uh, and among those who had bilateral renal artery stenosis, uh, about 78% tolerated well uh, the medication without any uh, significant complications. Uh, and by the way, the renal artery stenosis was defined as more than 60% stenosis. And when they did the multivariate analysis for, for deaths, uh, they found that those who were on ACE inhibitor or ARB had lower mortality compared to the group who were not on any uh, of these uh, of this drug. So to be back to going back to our case, um, so th this patient underwent a ultrasound Doppler, and she had multiple one done over 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 the years, um, and, and this shows a, and this shows a bilateral high grade stenosis without any change on the right. Uh, compared to the prior ultrasound from 2012, and probably progression on the left. And actually, that's one of the most dramatic reports I've read because uh, the radiologist called me and said, well, there is a very high-grade stenosis approaching 99% on the left. So basically, there's really, see, there's no flow to the left kidney. And I put some data here on pr the prior ultrasound, 2004, 2012, 2014, and you can see the kidney size on the right side had kind of decreased uh, a little bit. On the left side, more dramatically, was down to 8.4 centimeter. Uh, you can see the velocity also had increased uh, significantly on the right side. On the left side, it had decreased, and that's probably because there's no more flow to the kidney to generate uh, enough velocity. Uh, and the creatinine, you can see, had increased from 0 0.6 in 2004. In 2010, it was still uh, about the same. Two years later, it was up to one, and then at the time we saw her, it was 1.3, and the corresponding GFR uh, is, is there. So at this point, what would be uh, the next step? Uh, so first, uh, you might say, I would increase a furosemide dose. Two, you would add an ACE or a ARB to her regimen. 
three, you would do a CT angiogram of the renal artery, or you just go directly to an angiogram with the idea of putting stent bilaterally, or maybe you want to just put a stent on the left side. I remind you, the left side is the one that have the 99% stenosis and the smaller kidney. So go ahead and vote. Okay. So the response might come up before the vote, but uh, let's see what happens here. Okay, well, perfect. So, so most of you uh, picked uh, uh, the answer number five, and there's no, no, not necessarily a right or wrong answer here, but I will tell you uh, what, what we did. Uh, so, so before I uh, tell you what we did, uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, the, what we learned from the clinical trial of renal vascular disease. Um, and, and so the, the, the pendulum has swings over the year. Uh, before, very long time ago, 50 years ago, and some of you might remember, nephrectomy was one option actually when patients have severe hypertension and then once drug became available, then we moved to control blood pressure with, with medication. And then the stenting era uh, came along and seems in some places in the, the country, everybody would be getting stenting when they have renal artery stenosis. Very, very, very often, that was, these patients have multivascular disease and often they get a clear angiogram on the, on the way to the heart, they kind of uh, put dye in the kidney, oh, there is stenosis, and then they kind of put a stent there with the idea of this will uh, improve blood pressure and uh, et cetera. And then further study and larger randomized study have been published uh, more recently, the, the ASTRAL trial showing really, uh, no, the, excuse me, the CORAL trial showing really no difference between medical management and, uh, uh, and uh, interventional management. And, uh, uh, and for example, so we have three major trials published over the last few years. The STAR trial published in 2009 as long as was ASTRAL and then the CORAL was the most recent one, the uh, largest one as well. I'm not going to go through the detail. This is a nice summary slide that, that you can review. Uh, but none of these trials uh, showed any difference between uh, uh, current medical management for blood pressure control and other outcomes such as declining kidney function and stenting. The, the, the problem with this trial uh, that, uh, is that the inclusion criteria of these patients. And ma many of these patients, for example, in the ASTRA trial, patients were randomized and referred by their physician um, if the physician was not certain whether there will be a clinical benefit for, uh, for the revascularization, revascularization or not. Uh, and many of these patients, they excluded patients with very severe disease uh, as well. So in, in that population, maybe that's, that's correct, there's really no benefit. And most of the time you can uh, manage uh, renal artery stenosis and hypertension uh, medically. But there are some uh, and I mentioned that, so I'm going to skip this, uh, this slide, but there are so, so, some, some very high risk uh, clinical presentation and, and some of you, and maybe especially as a nephrologist among you, would recognize that some patients are very different and are not similar to the one that are included in clinical trial. And our job is really to, rec to, to recognize these patients. And this is uh, one paper published in AJKD uh, last year, uh, looking at 467 uh, uh, patient with renal artery stenosis uh, above 50%. They have been followed for about four years. And a quarter of them underwent revascularization and half had at least one high-risk clinical presentation. And so how they define high-risk clinical presentation is those patients who had flash pulmonary edema, refractory hypertension, or rapid decline in the GFR. And what they looked at, uh, the following outcome that can, uh, uh, so that occurred in about fifth, uh, half of the patient, um, cardiovascular event about one third, and then uh, kidney failure in about 18%. And what, what they found here, uh, so I'm focusing on the graph on the left side, uh, the survival curve. So those patients who presented with flash pulmonary edema, 
they look in their uh, data, and this is not prospective, so this is all retrospective data, but they look at their patient who underwent uh, medical therapy versus revascularization. And those who underwent uh, medical therapy did worse than the other group um, uh, in case they presented with pulmonary edema. Same thing, they look at the group who presented with refractory hypertension and rapidly declined GFR, and I found same, same pattern. Also, I have to uh, notice that the, the number are really small, so there's really not a very large number, but you can see some signal there. So ba back to our case, so we, we, uh, what we did actually, we sent them to the vascular surgeon and we were concerned that the uh, right kidney is al already small and probably have not much uh, more function and we're concerned that it's going to happen the same thing to the uh, uh, right kidney. Also we're concerned about the presentation with hypertension emergency a few months earlier and flash pulmonary edema, so we felt that we need to do something. So the vascular surgeon uh, did proceed with the angiogram. Uh, they did a bilateral angiogram, and uh, actually what we, we had recommended is that they do something about the right kidney if, if possible. And you can see, I uh, highlighted here, this, the narrow stenosis on the right side. There's also, this, this might not project very well, but there's stenosis on the left side. And uh, actually what the surgeon did, they put a stent on the right side and you can see here uh, the uh, improvement of the, the stenosis. And they tried to uh, look on the left side, and they were able actually to put a stand on the left side as well. I, I didn't put an image, I think, here. But so patient was in the hospital for a few days uh, or two days after the procedure, uh, and they, we did repeat the ultrasound of the kidney. I can see the velocity on the right side uh, d d improved uh, dramatically. Even on the left side, uh, it uh, did decrease, and the serum creatine improved from 1.3 to 0 0.9. Um, patient was dismissed from the hospital. She followed up with her local physician a week later. Uh, she was off the Lasix, and they reduced the nifedipine to once a day from twice a day, and they kept her on the previous uh, uh, regimen. And her blood pressure was really dramatically much better, improved to, down to the 100 systolic over 70s. And she came actually a few weeks earlier uh, for her four months uh, follow-up visit, and her creatine was stable at one. And she was completely off the nifedipine. Blood pressure was very well controlled just on the atenolol and the isosorbide. Now, now this is a different scenario here. I kind of put uh, this, uh, this image here because uh, the vascular surgeon called us on this patient, because uh, this is an 83-year-old man, also a very known vasculopath. And you can see that he has a aneurysm here, and the surgeon were going to uh, intervene on that. But they have also noticed that he has bilateral renal artery stenosis. Uh, and on, on the right side, on the left side, you can see it here. So he had really high-grade renal artery stenosis, and uh, the, the surgeon uh, ask us, well, I'm going to intervene there. Do you want us to do anything about the renal artery? And so this patient's creatine was normal, was one. He did have fully controlled hypertension with a grade one uh, out of four diastolic dysfunction, and his blood pressure wasn't, wasn't perfect, uh, but he was only on amlodipine 5 milligram. And so this is a very different scenario. He never presented with pulmonary edema, or worsening kidney function, but this is uh, what, what, we, what we obtain. And his blood pressure, even not controlled, he was not on a significant uh, dose of medication. So for this patient, we didn't, we recommend not to intervene on these renal arteries, and we increase his amlodipine. By, we doubled the amlodipine, and his blood pressure was already better by just going up to 10 milligrams. His blood pressure went down to the 140, 150 range. And you might argue for this uh, gentleman who's uh, 83, that might uh, be enough uh, or a reasonable control. So we were very reluctant, uh, and uh, as nephrologists or a nephrology community, we usually have been very shy to proceed with any intervention on the renal arteries. But there are, I think, few situations where uh, it's important to recognize and intervene when possible. But this one, for example, we, 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 we did not recommend that. So my clinical first, so despite the evidence that medical management is equivalent to revascularization in controlling blood pressure, 
there is still a role of revascularization in high risk situation, defined as flash pulmonary edema and relative recent decline in kidney function with refractory hypertension. Um, especially those where you try to use an asymmetry or ARB because these agents work really well on this patient, but some patients cannot tolerate these medications. Their creatinine increases dramatically after introducing these agents, and uh, you will have to back up in this situation. I think that was my last slide on, on this case. Uh, if there's any question, I'll be happy to take one now. Otherwise, yes, go ahead. Uh, right, yeah, and, and that's a great question. And, and certainly those agents work very well because the hypertension in this situation is very renin mediated. So these agents work very well to control the blood pressure. Uh, the issue is what's going to happen. You, you never know what's going to happen to the kidney function as far as creatinine until you start them. And you, you probably want to kind of go start with a lower dose and reassess uh, closely the creatinine and, and see, I mean, uh, you can do it with urinary uh, stenosis, with bilateral stenosis, if you carefully watch the kidney function. And when I started as a nephrologist, that was something that we're, uh, I was told is to be always worried about uh, the, the decline in the kidney function. And uh, uh, I have a great colleague, Dr. Texter, who's uh, known in that field and he's done a lot of trials. He was part of the CORAL trial and he has some other trials ongoing now. And he said, well, he, he wouldn't hesitate to use these agents, actually, uh, with careful monitoring, because not everybody will tolerate them. So, so I'm going to repeat the question for, for the audience who are not here. So the question is about how about uh, the use of aldosterone uh, antagonist, uh, oh, I'm sorry, aldosterone, right, uh, in, in this situation. And uh, I, typically I go with ACE or ARB uh, first, and then you can, the, the problem is often you have Decline kidney function, you might have hyperkalemia problems as well, so that might be the limitation, limita limiting factor. Okay, so th th there is a nice uh, algorithm here that was published actually from uh, one of our uh, colleagues in, in Rochester in NDT, and uh, I'm not going to go through uh, through that, but uh, you, you're, uh, it's in, in your handout and uh, you can access that uh, journal as well, but. This is kind of putting into the algorithm for the high clinical syndromes uh, I discussed about and potentially uh, uh, leading toward uh, renal revascularization. Okay, I'm going to uh, switch gear and uh, move on to case uh, two. And, and this is a 58-year-old woman with stage four to five chronic kidney disease, second to diabetes. Uh, she was admitted to the hospital because of bilateral pain and skin lesions in her leg, consistent with uh, calcific uremic arteriopathy or calciphylaxis. Her creatinine is 3.5, her estimate GFR was 14 at that time. And she was started on treatment with sodium thiosulfate. Uh, they, she was given 25 gram intravenously daily uh, in the hospital, and then she was discharged from the hospital after three days, and a week later she came back for follow-up to the clinic. And clinically she was doing uh, better, her blood pressure is listed there, uh, she has class 3 obesity, and her skin lesions were, were healing, so she was kind of uh, satisfied or happy with that, the physician was happy as well. And before moving forward, uh, I'm bringing up this question. So which of the following complication is the most likely to develop during sodium thiosulfate therapy? Uh, we've been seeing more and more uh, this being used, and I, I don't know uh, your experience uh, with, with, that, uh, with that therapy. Um, there's really no strong evidence about this medication, uh, meaning it's not, there's no randomized studies. 
There have been a lot of observation studies and it seems to be working. Um, the few cases I've seen, um, uh, it looks promising or you can see improvement, whether it's the drug or other stuff we're doing, I don't know for sure. But uh, you might be seeing this medication used. Um, and so you can go ahead and, and vote. Uh, so one is hypocalcemia, two is hypomagnesemia, three is hypernatremia, or four is onion gap metabolic acidosis. This, this arrow moved, uh, that's not the correct answer. Uh, so the correct answer is actually number four, for some reason. Uh, so, so you can see the, the answer are quite, quite split there, but uh, the, answer, the correct answer is onion gap metabolic acidosis. And uh, uh, this is just to illustrate what casphylaxis might look like, okay? It could be very nasty and very high mortality rate. Uh, those patients who develop casphylaxis uh, I'm going to skip this one and just uh, show you a few other studies here. Uh, so as far as uh, efficacy of this treatment, I will talk what is as, uh, sodium thiosulfate, but there is this study published uh, uh, a year or two ago now in uh, the clinical journal of the American Society of Nephrology, looking at 172 patients uh, who had, uh, who were, these are dialysis patients uh, who had uh, calciphylaxis and uh, received uh, sodium thiosulfate therapy. Among these, 147 completed the whole treatment and uh, from the 147, they surveyed uh, another 53. Um, as far as they followed the, all these patients, but they did a, a, a survey for the, uh, one, about one third of them. And among these uh, patients who completed the whole treatment, so about a quarter had complete resolution of their uh, Classifylaxis. Uh, another 20% had marked improvement, another third uh, had improvement. So about 75% had either complete resolution or some type of improvement. And some people didn't have any improvement at all, and another 20% didn't have enough data to know what happened to them. Uh, and w when they looked at uh, laboratories, uh, you can see here I highlighted the serum anion gap. And this is before initiation of the therapy. You can see the onion gap was about 14. During therapy, it was average about 18. And then after they completed therapy, it dropped to 11.6. Uh, and this kind of best, best, this is only one case, but it kind of best illustrates what can happen with uh, this medication. Uh, so this is a patient on dialysis, chronic dialysis. And you can see here, it, uh, it, here is a dialysis session he had. He had a high onion gap, and normally they will expect it to improve after dialysis, uh, certainly. And then he, he gets uh, so 25 gram of sodium thiosulfate, and you can see the onion gap increase significantly until the next dialysis session where it improved and then go up again. And then I decided not to give him thiosulfate after the last dialysis run, so the onion gap decreases of remains relatively stable and improve with further dialysis session. And then as soon as you get another dose, the onion gap increased significantly. And then here he gets a reduced dose and you can see the, imp the increase in the onion gap was not as significant. So I think that kind of illustrates well, uh, and I think that's convincing that sodium thiosulfate does affect uh, uh, cause metabolic acidosis. And that's not surprising because this is a, a, an acid. And the, the way it presumably works, so you have a two sodium molecule and a sulfate molecule here. And presumably the way it works on calciphylaxis is that it, it have different uh, role of antioxidant, uh, vasodilation, and also calcium chelation. That's what's the proposed mechanism. And and uh, the reason I, I bring this up is because this patient here that, uh, in the previous slide and develop really significant uh, metabolic acidosis. Uh, uh, this patient was actually not on dialysis, okay? And he received uh, sodium thiosulfate treatment and he developed severe anion gap acidosis, uh, even bleeding. Around the same time he had a cardiac arrest the thought is that 
he had significant acidosis that might have led to a circulatory collapse because after he had the cardiac arrest, it was kind of hard, even though he got the, all the, by protocol, the epinephrine and everything, he was not responding well uh, to the treatment. And sodium thiosulfate is being cleared by the, so you can clear that with dialysis, but if you're using it in patient with uh, chronic kidney disease, like this patient who had stage four to stage five chronic kidney disease, you have to be careful about the dose and the frequency of using the medication, kind of follow the anion gap, uh, make sure they don't develop a severe uh, acidosis. Again, this is not, calciphylaxis is not a very common problem, but we see it, especially in patients who don't follow well on dialysis, their calcium and phosphorus uh, control is very poor, their diet is very poor. Um, some pe people who have been on warfarin as well uh, have been incriminated maybe to be a factor uh, leading to calciphylaxis. And uh, this, besides the dermatological care and skin care, um, this medication has been used more and more. I know we've been using it more. Uh, it may be working, uh, or it seems to be working. Um, but we have to be careful if it's happened early on in patient was not, not on dialysis to be careful about the dosing. And as I stated uh, uh, b before, we don't understand very well the pathogenesis uh, of the calciphylaxis, and the mortality is very high, about 50 or up to 80% mortality within the uh, six months. Okay. So the clinical per from uh, th this case is that sodium thiosulfate is increasingly being used for treatment of calcif calcific uremic arteriolopathy. It's usually well tolerated and considered safe, uh, but it's a strong acid and can cause anion gap metabolic acidosis, uh, which can be severe, and this will require uh, dosage reduction in non-dialysis uh, CKD patient. Okay. You have a comment or? Yeah, that, that, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, first, clinically, usually this presents a kind of symmetric uh, uh, distribution, so that's kind of one of the clue. Usually kind of the inner thighs or sometimes the abdomen, uh, but it's typically very symmetric. If it's not, then you kind of you doubt the, the diagnosis. Certainly the, the real diagnosis uh, to confirm that is a skin biopsy, and uh, we do it uh, from time to time. The issue with that is those patients tend to have wound infection very easily. So if you do a wound biopsy, sometimes it never heals and it gets infected. Um, so th that's the tricky part. And the decision is kind of, uh, uh, to do a biopsy or not is based on, I mean, ca case by case. I cannot say anything about that because we I never use it or we never use it at Mayo for that purpose. Uh, uh, yeah, we, we mainly use a skin biopsy uh, if you're in doubt of the diagnosis uh, or if you want to confirm it before we go with, with treatment. Uh, we, we've also used as far as skin care, hyperbaric oxygen as well uh, with the idea of kind of you can heal faster with, with kind of higher oxygen uh, uh, but, but again, these are not proven. Uh, but with, with this disease like this, where this have high mortality, kind of, you, you sometimes try everything, it gives a better chance for the patient to, to, uh, to move and improve. And uh, some patients do very well and improve, but the other half don't make it too far to get infection and complication and, and just die. Okay. Very good. So, so my... Uh, 
so a few years ago, and some of you might be familiar with that, but there is a new mnemonic for uh, metabolic acidosis. Uh, I call it the new mud pie. It's called the gold mark. And as uh, published by Dr. Meta and Emmett um, uh, in uh, the, the Lancet, uh, it's called the onion gap mnemonic for the 21st century, just kind of to update, because some of the things within the mud pie, we don't see them anymore. Uh, and so the gold mark stands for, G stands for glycol, so you have the ethylene and glycol and, and family. O is for oxoproline, which is the de derivative of the uh, Tylenol or acetaminophen. Uh, L is for L lactate, D is for D lactate, uh, M for the methanol, A for aspirin, R for renal failure, and K for uh, ketoacidosis. And uh, so that's a gold mark, and we said with uh, sodium thiosulfate, uh, just to not forget that, so well, maybe we can add the S to the marks so you can have it gold marks and, and keep it in, in mind, so. Okay, I'm going to move to the uh, third uh, and last case, and this is a, a dialysis case uh, in the elderly. And uh, a 76-year-old man is referred, uh, was referred to the nephrology clinic to discuss renal replacement therapy option. And he has CKD, which has been attributed to nephrosclerosis and hypertension, which has worsened uh, over the last few years. His past medical history include heart failure with an IHA class three, hypertension, uh, atrial fibrillation, and peripheral vascular disease. Typical uh, uh, vasculopath uh, patient. Uh, he's on furosemide, carvedilol, aspirin, atorvastatin. Uh, he lives with his wife. Uh, he's sedentary. He is dependent on the walker and even has difficulty with transfer. He does not smoke. He's frail on exam. His BMI is 20. His blood pressure is 115 over 62. The rest of his exam is normal. So the question is, what, uh, uh, which of the following should you do next? So one is you initiate a low-protein diet to delay dialysis as long as possible. Two, you discuss with the patient and his family the option of palliative care. Three, you recommend in-center hemodialysis to improve his survival. Or you recommend home dial peritoneal dialysis to improve his survival. So again, again go ahead and vote. I'm going to close the vote here, and uh, well, that's uh, also work backward for me. So uh, let me see here. Okay, you can see the answer are split between one, three, and four. Uh, I'm sorry, one, two, and four. And uh, the the, the mo most I mean, the answer uh, I'm looking for is, is two to discuss with the patient and his family the option of palliative care. And uh, I will kind of show some recent li literature and the importance of doing this upfront. Uh, so there is, further is this kind of nice tool. Uh, this is published in the, the Clinical Journal of the American Society of Nephrology three years ago. And what I look is at the six month prognosis of patients who, who are above 75 years old uh, and start dialysis. So I look at different factors listed here, whether they are to, uh, dependent on transfer, their BMI is very low, they have peripheral vascular disease stage three or four, heart failure stage three or four, uh, some social uh, severe behavior disorder, if they had unplanned dialysis initiation, active malignancy, diabetes, or dysrhythmia. And you kind of put this course together and you can come up with a six month mortality rate. So if you go back to this patient here, uh, I had in yellow uh, the relevant one, heart failure, atrial fibrillation, peripheral vascular disease, sedentary, and he needs help with transfer. And BMI is not below the 18.5 that I highlighted here. So if you apply this to this patient, this, this scoring system, uh, he would uh, uh, have those one highlighted here. And that will give him a six month mortality rate of about 50%. Okay, now there is another tool, uh, and some of you might be familiar with that. Um, I use uh, this app quite often, QXMD, online calculator, and they have one for the six months mortality uh, on patients who are on dialysis. 
And this is maybe a simpler way to use it. And I put here the link. You can go online and um, you can use it in the clinic or uh, uh, without needing an app uh, if you are on a computer. But this includes the age, serum albumin, whether they have dementia or not, peripheral vascular disease. And this is what we call the surprise question. Basically, you kind of ask their physician, uh, and maybe if you're familiar with that, uh, would I be surprised if this patient died in the next uh, year? Okay, and you answer yes or not. So this is basically clinical judgment uh, of the physician. Um, and so for this patient, I, I, uh, we, we, we knew some of the, these factors. I, he was 76, he had no dementia, and he does have peripheral vascular disease. And then the one I put in yellow here, I just assume. So because he, he, he appeared to be malnourished and his BMI was low, I assume his albumin, let's say, is going to be 2.5. And I wouldn't be surprised if he dies in the next year. So this will give you a mortality estimate of about 67%, quite high. Now, put some other example. Let's say we, you change the serum albumin value to 3. And that improve it uh, quite a bit, uh, up to 44, uh, down to 44 percent for the six months mortality. Uh, now, if I keep the same and change the surprise question, say, well, I mean, I think he's doing great and uh, he's going to survive this year. So, if you put that, that kind of change your balance uh, or the mortality to down to 20 percent. And if you put back uh, or improve his serum albumin to a normal range, then you can see his uh, mortality. Rate. I mean, this is all estimate based on uh, large populations, but that's kind of a helpful tool to start the discussion with a patient. Um, I, I think uh, with our population getting more and more older and more patients uh, potentially needing dialysis, uh, you, you, you want to, and many people feel the, that way, that you want to offer quality of life rather than quantity of life. So you want to improve their life and not prolong deaths. Um, that's kind of a, another way to put it. Um, so in this case, palliative care may be more appropriate to suggest than dialysis based on his high mortality rate. Uh, especially after age 75, for patients who have significant comorbidities, there might not be a real advantage. I'll show you another study on that. Uh, but the American Society of Nephrology encouraged nephrologists to engage with patients and their families in open discussion about the benefits or lack of benefit initiating dialysis, especially in patients where the benefit may be minimal. Uh, and we have sometimes this conflict of uh, patients who uh, reach end stage renal disease and they have family member and there's a lot of different opinion within the family member. Um, they have their daughter or their son coming from different state, they haven't seen their loved one for some time and they're kind of shocked to see what's happening and they want to everything to keep them alive, even though the patient sometimes realize that he doesn't want to go through that. So there is a lot of uh, education that needs to, to be done. And uh, as increasing evidence that initiation of hemodiasis in the very old may not significantly prolong survival and rarely improves the quality of life, this is study, this is a particular population because these are all nursing home residents, so not, uh, so keep that in mind. But in this uh, population who uh, required uh, initiation of dialysis, about 50% died within the first six months, and only 25% maintained their pre-existing functional status. And this is a nice study by Corella Tamura, published in the New England in 2009. And looking at the six months after initiation of dialysis, 50% died. And by one year, only 25% had uh, maintained their functional status. Okay, but again, this is a cohort of uh, a large cohort, but this is nursing home resident. Okay, keep that in mind. Um, I think this is my my last question here, uh, and you can go ahead and, and, and vote. So, the, the patient inquiry about his quality of life and especially the hospitalization need if he start dialysis, because uh, that's another important. Uh, marker, patient wants to know, well, if I start dialysis, do I require to be in the ho hospital and how many times I'm going to be hospitalized? Uh, so how many days on average a 70-year-old dialysis patient spends in the hospital? Okay. Let's 
let's see. Uh, well, the word didn't, oh, okay. So yeah, most of you identified the cor correct answer, uh, about two weeks basically for a 70 year old that compared about nine or 10 days for a younger dialysis patient. Uh, so that's information that patient might, might want to know or like, like to know. This is a study I mentioned, uh, uh, alluded to before, but uh, this patient, uh, a randomized study where I looked at patients who are older than 75, initiated uh, and randomized either to start dialysis or stay on conservative therapies. I had stage five chronic kidney disease. And obviously you can see here clearly that those who are on dialysis live longer, okay? Now, if you look, however, uh, at those who had high comorbidity score, okay, uh, ischemic heart disease, then there was no more difference in survival. So if you have really many comorbidities, speci specifically ischemic heart disease, there might not really be advantage whether you start dialysis or not. And the, the starting point was GFR of 15. Once they reach a GFR of 15, then they were randomized uh, after patient consent. Well, do you want to stay with conservative therapy or initiate dialysis uh, if needed? And this kind of bring us to the illness tra trajectory. So, uh, uh, and typically a end stage renal disease patient like a heart failure patient or COPD, they kind of decline over time with severe exacerbation over, over the time. Um, and that's kind of, in this paper, they kind of argue that if you have CKD stage four, you can maintain more a functional status until the very end where kind of you drop very quickly like in colon cancer or uh, other example like that. So you have to think about the uh, trajectory on one, one aspect, you have complete health on one, one end, the other end uh, um, uh, deaths. And then you can go from acute illnesses, move to chronic illnesses. And in the acute setting, you might have more intervention where you can cure patient and then over time with chronic illnesses become more and more palliative care depending on uh, their other comorbidities. Uh, and why this is important is because this is a projected number of uh, uh, the population who are going to be above age 65. So we're going to be dealing with these patients more and more and with all this problem and, and with increasing exp uh, life expectancy and many patients have a lot of chronic disease. It's important really to set uh, the discussion early on so that kind of people realize what to expect and uh, understand the real expectation and not just uh, to do things that are not, not uh, what they desire. I'm going to skip few slides because of the sake of time. I want to say as a disclaimer, uh, I'm not advocating against dialysis in the elderly. And actually the oldest patient I saw on dialysis as a trial was a 90 year old. We discussed with him and his family that uh, he was still functioning very well. He has a very supportive family. And we said, well, we can try it and see how you do. So we did a place a catheter and we did dialyze. And he was the best patient ever in my unit. He never had any hospitalization, never had any complication. His labs were always uh, well controlled. I didn't uh, need to co co complain about the phosphorus or the PTH or anything like that. Actually, we even put a fistula for him after six months. Uh, which some people think that was crazy, but he lived another four years and died at age of 94. And I'm going, uh, sorry if I went a little bit over, over time, but I'm happy to take any question if, uh, if there is. Okay, thank you, thank you very much.